conversation I've been looking forward to having for quite some time. Two friends of mine, two colleagues, you know them because they are award-winning journalists and broadcast journalism, but we're going to learn they're quite frankly good rockers as well. Don Haney from the KFGO News team joining me and Al Amit, former KFGO News, other uh, media, also instructor over at Moorhead State University. Gentlemen, thanks for coming in. How are we doing? We're doing great. great. It looks like fun. This I, I've been. I, I'm serious. You know, what, what do you what do you think think of things to talk about? I've been wanting to do this with you two for so long because I know the breadth of knowledge you have when it comes to rock and roll music, and the well, at least the, I used to. Well, it's too much yeah, to know about. Well, it, and if we, if the two of us, Al and I, get together, we talk a lot about a lot of different things, but usually it ends up with music. Yeah. And and we, well, we it, give one another gifts in their music. Uh, well, either I, books or CDs or whatever. So so how? I, I mean, th- this passion that you have. I mean, we, we I know people that, oh, yeah, I listen to this, that. You guys brought in albums, vinyl, some of them worn because you've listened to them so long. <laughs> they're dated. So, I mean, how did this, how did this start? Don, Al, how did you get so into music and collections of vinyl, for example? I well, ended up the first time, you know, when I really, I didn't really listen to a lot of music. I'd hear of radio locally. Uh, the, the town I was in, uh, they had a local radio, it was KTRF, and they had at nights, except, you know, and I was a Twins fan as a kid, I'd go to bed listening, but whenever that was on, Teen Top Toon Time was not. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again really fast. Teen <laughs> Top Toon Time. But, uh, you know, that's where you started listening to stuff, you know, the mm-hmm. monkeys and all this stuff, and, and uh, then some of the TV shows and that sort of thing, you'd see a little bit, you know, I'd, I'd watch like... Uh, American Bandstand, and I was only like in eighth grade, maybe. I don't know about Al. I was a little older. Than yeah, you. yeah, a little <laughs> older. But uh, in you know, I didn't didn't even like my parents knowing that I was listening to it when the Beatles were on for the first time at Ed Sullivan. I ran upstairs because I didn't want to look at it. My dad actually came and got me. Donald, you have to watch this. This may be history. And really? I still remember, and I don't know what grade I was in. It was 64, probably yeah, 65 when they were on. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know what got into me. Yeah. You know, I must have been, I don't know. But at any rate, it turned into a big uh, musical lover but, like Al Before did. we get to Al, so <laughs> how did your dad say this might be history? What was it about that moment that say, hey, you're going to want to watch this because you're going to remember it the rest of your life? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a music, it's a band that's yeah. going to be on a television show. What, what was it about that time that said, hey, you've got to watch this? I get the I, Moon I, Landing, I th- for th- example, yeah. right? But this is a, a rock and roll band on TV. <laughs> I, and surprisingly, you know, not too many years after that, he'd get mad at me for having the Beatles on too loud upstairs <laughs> yeah. in my uh, bedroom. But um, <laughs> I, I, I think it was just the fact they paid a lot of attention to news and stuff. And at that time, the Beatles were becoming very famous. Sure. You know, and I think they were kind of, uh, I'm sure they never knew, and of course, who did? You know, they were going to turn out the way they did, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm guessing that is it. But I still can't. I thought, well, what was wrong with me? Because <laughs> I literally <laughs> ran up the <laughs> steps yeah, and went to my bedroom. You know, it was a Sunday night. You can't explain <laughs> some childhood activities. I get that. I'm not going to even question. Yeah. Al, how about you? I, I grew up with, with radio. I remember as a, as a kid, these these things that stick in your in your head. Yeah, you know we used to uh, the Don McNeil's Breakfast Club. And I know that means nothing to anybody that's probably listening to this show today, but they would march around the kitchen table and they'd be talking about all this kind of stuff. And and I was just a, a little kid. In fact, this and this even predates that. <laughs> Manny, do you remember Manny Margette? Yes. Yeah, Manny Margette was a, a, a very very well known, if not just out and out famous broadcaster here in Fargo. And his apartment building, or his apartment, was right across the hall from where our apartment was on Broadway. I'm, I'm thinking maybe I was two or three, and and they had and they broadcast Manny, his wife, and Fan, or Manny and his wife Fanny broadcast a morning show from their apartment building. And I remember going over there as a two, three year old. Sure, holy and smoke! Wa- and the, this is no <laughs> kidding. This is no Quite kidding. The memory you got. And, and watching him broadcast. Well, here's the really interesting thing to me, anyway is that when I started my television career, Manny was still broadcast. That's where I really? knew of it, because yeah. I, you know, I wouldn't have known I mean, it he, that far. Very, very well known. But, but to, to the music thing, 
uh, like I told you, you know, I, I grew up listening to the radio. Uh -huh. I had a transistor radio, uh -huh. you know, and, and uh, had, when I washed the cars or did yard work or whatever, I always had the transistor radio with me and, and uh, rock. And, and I got into rock music, and my dad hated it. My dad was a Guy Lombardo fan, and my mom. And I remember they had those big, I bet your parents did too, mm -hmm. big stacks of 78s. You know, they didn't, they but didn't, they, huh? they had radio on, and my mom would always listen to the uh, soft music. That yeah, came through that, what, yeah, whatever. But but but, you know. but but anyway, so and I just it just went from there, and and I want when when I graduated from high school, I knew what I wanted to do. Only it didn't. I took a little turn somewhere along we, the line. We've all got <laughs> yeah, that story right. as well. Yeah, I, but <laughs> I love music, and I still do. And I mean, yeah. music is a huge part of my life. Well, yeah. and I know just casual conversations with both of you, whether it's through texts or just when we get together. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're wearing a Stones T-shirt right yep. now, Al. So, I mean, and when I used to go to the gym. Used to go to the gym. Used to, yeah. Used to. I've moved. That's And I just don't <laughs> that's find excuse, time. That's an excuse. It, it, one of two. The other is I just stopped going. Mm -hmm. uh, but that it, it's it's evident anytime music is brought up, uh, you guys are reaching out. And that's why I wanted yeah. to get you together. I mean, uh, for example, I... A little naive on a variety of things, depending on what the topic is. But <laughs> you know, downtown Fargo, there's a Bob Dylan mural that was mm -hmm. put up, and I, yeah. not knowing history as well as I should of the area here, throw it out there, and people instantly, how do you not know Bob Dylan lived downtown before he got famous? <laughs> blah blah blah, and uh, people are like, you got to talk to, you got to talk to Don. He knows all about this. You got to talk to Al. He knows do, all yeah. about this. Yeah. So I want to get into the collections you have here, but when it comes to, you guys are loving rock and roll you're mm -hmm. journalists you've had to cover bands or you mm -hmm. know area events yeah. what's the yeah. most unusual uh coverage that you've had to uh do of somebody that's come whether it's fargo Dome, the civic center just whatever it is is there something that stands out to you well you'd have to think a little bit uh you know you do have an opportunity and a lot of people around here wouldn't even know a guy by the name of Leo Kotke, but he's internationally known. He's a guitarist out of the Twin Cities. Uh, he still lives there. He still plays. I just saw him in April. I threw his back here. I think I saw him for the fifth or sixth time. And uh, I think Madison even knows who Leo Kotke is. Uh, a lot of people do. He, he's unbelievable. And uh, he always fills the stage and he travels all over the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the first times he was coming here, I was at a different radio station, and the news director there, Tom, myself, and a, a gentleman that uh, was working at uh, NDSU, he was one of the students, ran their uh, their board there, uh, played some music. We went to the green room out at uh, NDSU. He was going to play there. And I called and asked if, in fact, we could come out and do an interview with him. And it was uh, the winter afternoon. We went out, and... Uh, he was just getting done doing his practice, and he took us into what they call the green room. It really was a green room, a neat room out at NDSU. <laughs> and we ended up being with him for two hours, and he was telling us all these stories. And I told him, I knew your uncle, who was a provost at a, a technical or a community college that I went to up in northern Minnesota. And he's, well, yeah. And I said, well, he always, a couple times for me, he tried to bring you to that small city, and you're always like in Europe or somewhere like that. But he, he told stories that uh, I still remember. And afterwards, during the concert that night, and it was full out at NDSU, um, he brought our names up because he said, I told him they're going to have to come back uh, backstage. And, I mean, we we had, you know, hors d'oeuvres and wine afterwards. <laughs> and one of the guys I was with took a perfect picture, I thought, of myself with, with uh, this hero of mine. Uh, had, with his arm around me and smiling, and uh, he screwed up my camera, so I never got a picture. No, I have, no, I have, I have that, pictures. No. I have pictures of them, but uh, you but know, not with you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's that's how you kind of come across stuff, and that's just a small one there. But Al, yeah, I know you've seen more than a few. I, well, I think I think one of the most. Uh, well, there there are a couple of them, and mm -hmm. I know one of them you're going to remember. But oh, yeah. uh, I think it was '76. Uh, NDSU <laughs> decided that they were going to the athletic department was going to raise some money. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think that was the year. And uh, so they put on a concert out at Dakota Field, and they had just put down the AstroTurf. And there was this hue and cry in the community. Yeah. Oh, good Lord, they're going to have this big concert out there, and all those people are going to be out there smoking pot and burn holes in the AstroTurf. So what they ended up doing was covering the uh, AstroTurf with tarp, as I recall. But it was just an incredible show. And I think about this. 
Henry Gross was the opener. He at that time he had a song <laughs> called Shannon, which was about his dog, which I think was the worst song he ever did. Frankly, <laughs> he did some really great rock and roll. Yeah. And then that, that was followed by Jeff Beck, and that was followed by Fleetwood Mac, and that was when Rumors was was really oh, hot. My word, at yeah. ASU at the yeah. Field. Yeah, and my a buddy of mine, Lon Albright, uh, came with me, and he was my sound man. He carried a parabola parabolic mic for me and i was shooting and we, we were and i was shooting film at, yeah. at that time and we were we were up up on stage uh probably from here over there to that office from stevie nicks and, and mm -hmm. christine mcvee and they looked at us and kind of smiled you know yeah. but <laughs> it was gonna nod uh, <laughs> it was i mean you talk about a rush that was really really a a, a rush personally and professionally for me we put together a really good story on it. We'd done a couple of stories leading up to it. And somewhere you said you might have still had the film. Well, I do. I have. I have a. Really? I have a. Yeah, it's a three a three quarter inch video <laughs> of the of the story that we put on on the air. And I mean, it was it was really fun. But I remember Aid Sponberg. I, gra I grabbed him afterwards, and I said uh, <laughs> he was the athletic director at the time. And I said. Uh, so how much money did you take in it? Oh, we can't talk about that. He said <laughs> it was so hot, people were fainting. Oh, it including was my was. wife. My wife had really, uh, yeah. But uh, you had wine skins, didn't you? Yes, they took it away from us. So you were not able to do that. We drove all the way from Grafton, North Dakota, to go there with some friends. However, uh, I still remember towards the end of the uh, of, of that particular part with Fleetwood Mac, black skies and a, a thunderstorm came in. And there was Stevie Nicks out at the end. I don't know if you were still there for that oh, yeah. part of it. When she had her, you know, beautiful clothes on. Sure. And she was singing Rihanna. And the wind was blowing. And, I mean, you talk, you know, she always sang like it was supposed to be a witch. And her clothes were flying oh, in the wind. And I... I mean, if you ever saw that again, you wouldn't believe. You'd think it was something. I kind of kinda got goosebumps when you're describing well, I'd it. I never forget now. it because I was a big Fleetwood Mac yeah. fan since before those guys ever came on. You know, I, probably I back can, to sixty. I think you can see that video on my video. If I well, can you find better find it. <laughs> I, no, I've got it. I can tell you exactly. I know you've it. told me many times, and I keep on saying, "Well, I hope he finds it." Yeah, you find that. You yeah. know what? We get that on this history. KFGO uh, podcast. <laughs> uh, we got streaming in here. You're you can find somebody to transfer a three-quarter inch tape to. <laughs> digital that'd be i mean because i'd love to have a copy of what i could see again oh, myself. Man. but if, if we if we if it's okay if we can continue yeah do you remember how the cops were really cracking down on on concerts at mm -hmm. the civic civic mm -hmm. i mean they were they'd go through handbags they'd basically frisk you i remember uh uh black oak arkansas played <laughs> and that was one that they were really interested in, and uh was it Jim Dandy? I think was their lead singer. Yep. Jim Dandy and, to the rest. Yep. Yeah, and then yep. there was a, a woman with red hair who played over at uh, oh in Moorhead at the can't think of the name of the place either. Uh, it was a great rock and roll bar. Mm -hmm. um, Ruby Star, and that was that was mm -hmm. his backup singer. But that was one that they were really laying for because they thought there was going to be all kinds of drugs there because of the mm. the, the oh, genre of the music yeah, you know, rock and roll drugs sex all <laughs> that go yeah. hand in hand right yeah well you can't blame them for no. that fargo cops are really starting to crack down on rock and roll concerts because everybody thinks it's drug sex rock and roll right mm -hmm. now i understand that uh, don you got something uh, from the fargo civic center police report because oh. of some suspicious activity <laughs> that was going on there. tell this, us about this uh, well a friend of mine gave me this copy and it, it is uh from october it was from November of 1967. It was the Fargo Civic Center. And I often thought if the Civic Center could talk, the number of rock and roll oh, groups gosh. that have been there, plus a lot of other things. But this one, it's uh, three different reports from Fargo police officers. One of them is a lieutenant. One of them I think I actually knew. He's long retired. But uh, basically, there was a concert there. It opened with the Unbelievable Uglies, which were they, they were a huge band across this whole region. Mm -hmm. Kind of crazy, and I, I actually knew one of them, and I don't know, you know, those guys moved up in age, too, and that, but... Um, Better it, than it, the alternative. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But in this one, the Unbelievable Ugly started, and then they were kind of the opening act, and the police said they were some of the most horrific parts of the whole thing. There was a riot in the Civic Center where kids were going, they were they were throwing bottles, they were pulling tiles off, they were they were flooding the toilets, uh, plugging them. I mean, it was just it was crazy, and I thought this is in Fargo, North Dakota, in 1967. <laughs> but the uh, the funny part, and I have to try find it here, but uh, one of them brought it up, and uh, once the uglies got done. And apparently they were very naughty up on stage on top of it. The cops were really upset. Um, oh, okay. 
the uh, the group that they brought up, and I should have had this ready, but turned out they wrote and they said there was this group. Uh, it was called not the Uglies, but Who? They didn't say the Who. The Who, the who from <laughs> England, and uh, Who, and uh, they started talking about it. Yeah, the next band on stage was Who from England. This band uh, ended their act by busting up their whole band, throwing all of their equipment, drums, guitars, amplifiers, drumsticks. In fact, everything in the band went flying. After the display, there was no holding. The kids uh, tore up the place uh, in turmoil. Even uh, the tile was ripped from the floor. <laughs> Those and were the days. <laughs> and no, I, I only, I only uh, knew this, the, the guy that was the mayor of Fargo, I, I knew him later as a legislator, but you remember uh, the mayor. Uh, Herschel? Lashkowitz. Herschel Lashkowitz. Yeah. And he was quite upset. And uh, I don't have that information, but I do remember seeing it somewhere uh, where uh, he banned them from ever coming back to Fargo. <laughs> the who abandoned Fargo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and at that time, they Imagine were starting to get that. big. Well, they but, haven't been back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that it's I'm aware stuck. of. But I mean, it's just, it's it's cool, some of the stuff. And when you hear the names of people. Yeah. I had a friend of mine not too long ago tell me, we were talking about music, and um, I was told that, you know, like, uh, what's the uh, what's the facility out at NDSU? It, it was it's it's not it's not one of the big arenas. It's right off uh, University there, and I can't. Bison remember. Sports Arena? No, or? not the arena. It's further south. It's an old one where the oh uh, the Armory. Yeah, the Armory thing. Yeah, uh, a okay. lot of bands there. I did see Chuck Maggio once with a bunch of friends when I worked at the other place. But uh, they said, well, I went to this this Hall and Oates played there, and I said, are you kidding me? You know, and you just. You know, if I think of those places could talk, it may sound weird, but when well, you think realize... About Detroit, but think about Detroit yeah. Lakes. You have that picture of, uh, is it Jeff Beck <laughs> and uh, they Robert were with, Plant? Who was, isn't that who was in that picture? I don't remember. Yeah, right? they, were, they were with the Uglies. It was the Yardbirds. You know, the Yardbirds, that's right. <laughs> but those places can't talk, but you guys can. You know, that, that's why, you know, I mean, getting this out, you know, because... There, there's a history here, right? Mm-hmm. That, that you know, as somebody that's 35 years old, I appreciate the music. Mm-hmm. I've heard it, but I haven't had a chance to live it. Right? Yeah, but you have great musical abilities too. Uh, and yeah, well, you, you, no, I know you know. You, you're telling me some of your uh, best music, you know. Oh yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I'm a classic. I, you know, it's funny hearing from you guys because <laughs> you know my parents grew up in rock and roll, and mm-hmm. that you know my generation is you know that we. We were like encouraged to listen to this stuff because it became accepted. <laughs> you guys went through that whole transition where got to keep it from mom and dad, or you know, it's just such a different mm-hmm. way of appreciation of music. You almost yeah. felt like you're doing something wrong by listening to it, <laughs> and that's why you know just how things have changed so much. You talk about these these bands that are coming and going. That mm-hmm. oh, I came across Hall and Oates. We don't really have that now. No, you know, I mean, so I appreciate learning from you guys about this. And, and about what this area has, and the stories to be told here. Um, now, you guys have vinyl records in front of you. Mm-hmm. I mean, collections, and I know it's sometimes... I brought this one for you. It's been a roller coaster. I had a huge record collection at one time. Yeah, uh, how many? Uh, I I may have not be exact on, but it was about 5,600 and some that I sold about the time everybody was starting to get, including yours truly, into uh, CDs. But uh-huh. I, I found I, and I sold it for pennies on the dollar. And I go out to these record stores now, and even the used ones, I see them, and I'm going, ah, oh, why did I do that? And plus, the problem was, I, I, I don't remember exactly how much I got, but this guy bought all of them, and uh, I, I had a, a billfold that I lost the next day with 200 of the dollars that I. Oh had. no! <laughs> but uh, I did save some of them. Now, there's probably a lot of people don't even know. I, I look kind of stupid here, but this is Jethro Tull, uh-huh. Ian Anderson and company, who have played here. Jack uh, had a, uh, Ian Anderson online when they moved into Fargo for that concert. I still remember Jack Jack Sunday would he get all these people, you know? But uh, <laughs> but this is one of their best albums, and uh, there it is. Uh, that's probably, gosh, it's got to be '69 maybe or something like Jeez. that. I was in high school, but. Uh, and uh, if you're watching at KFGO.com, <laughs> it's got a pop-up in the middle of this yep. vinyl. So you can go to KFGO.com if you're well, listening on. Kind of silly. Here. It is. Al, you got a large collection, too. Well, not as many as, as Don, not even close. But yeah. and, and I have, uh, Don and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, I, uh, about <laughs> valuable. Some of the albums, some of these older ones are really very, very, very valuable. Mm-hmm. 
This is probably the oldest one that I still still have. Oh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Uh, Jerry, live at the Star Club in Hamburg. And I think this goes back to about 1964, 65, hmm. something like this. And a friend of mine uh, was a, uh, a big, knew that I was a big Jerry Lee Lewis fan. And I brought a CD of his along too, because I want to tell you something about that. But uh, <laughs> this is this is some of the stuff that my dad hated. Look at the short look at the short haircuts on the, on those guys, you know. And the Star Club and the Star Club in Hamburg yeah. was a hot, hot spot for the Beatles. Beatles That's yeah. where they were yeah. basically discovered. Hmm. And then I brought this one along as an example as well. This is uh, Leonard Skinner's uh, uh, Street Survivors. Yes. I was a big Skinner fan. Mm-hmm. This album was they they pulled the cover off this one. And changed it because this was this album came out just after the plane crash, oh, which killed sure. Ronnie Van Zant, yeah. mm-hmm. Cassie and Stevie Gaines, and and a couple of other uh, mm. members of. Uh, I of remember the band. that very well so they, yep. because of all the fire, mm-hmm. and they sure. and they complete they completely uh, changed it. Mm. Interestingly enough, a good buddy of mine uh, <laughs> just happened to be driving. Well, he was driving back from Florida, and he drove through this town, and there was a little sign up that said, "This is the site of." The when, crash? when the Leonard Skinner's plane crashed, oh, wow. which was, Leonard Skinner is not a person. No, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, he probably well, was at one I, time. I, th- I think it was they, a teacher they, they or something. Named him a gym yeah. teacher. Yeah, I think yeah. Is what so, the, yeah. there's all kinds of uh, yeah. stories about that. You mentioned <laughs> Leonard Skinner being a fan, and I told you how my parents growing up with this music <laughs> encouraged us to listen to it. And <laughs> Leonard Skinner's one that I remember uh, driving. Yeah, again, triggering those uh, childhood mm-hmm. memories, driving with my dad from Devil's Lake back to Leeds, and we're about at the bend at Church's Ferry, and he had Leonard Skinner playing on his, uh, must have been a cassette tape. He goes, man, I wish uh, I wish that plane wouldn't crash. You would have loved this band, you know, and what the what the kind of music they have. Oh, yeah. Still listen to them to this day. You know, oh, it's yeah. just great stuff. I thought you were going to say you were playing Freebird, and you went to speed it up to about 80 miles an hour. <laughs> <going around. laughs> Uh, as far as you know, special prints, special covers, which one of your collections do you say, okay, this is this is the special one, the one that might be wow. one or the one that, hey, I, I I don't even dare take this out of the package. Do you guys have one? You know, I uh, I never bought records uh, even as a kid. I'd, I'd order them periodically from the local record store because there were certain ones I'd read on Rolling Stone, which started to come out, and I'd run to the store to get one of those uh, magazines. Because you didn't, you didn't have the ability. Lots of times with the kind of music we'd buy, that was really it was there was top forty stations sure. out there. And I grew up in northwestern Minnesota, so a lot of the music I listened to was from Winnipeg. And some of their Winnipeg stations were super duper. I mean, you know, and they they still are. But um, I, man, I couldn't even think of anything. Uh, well. Well, what's what's really bad? At one time. It's well, tough to yeah. Well, way. there was some. I remember I got in trouble. I was shopping. Uh, my mom was no longer living, but my, I went with my dad periodically for groceries. And of all places, at a supermarket, it was Hart's Grocery. Well, Hart's company was a big uh, distributor around this area. But um, <laughs> I looked and I said, "Oh, there's Todd Rudgren. Something, anything." It was a double album. And I threw it into the basket without him knowing. And, of course, at that time, uh, yeah, the albums were still, well, at that time, you'd think they were expensive. But I suppose that one was extra because it was double. And when I got home, I opened it. And it was one of their limited albums where the albums were they were colored. And one was red and one was blue. And if I still had that, a, f- a cousin of mine saw it one time before I'd sold it. And he said, geez, Don, that's probably worth about... Um, it could be five hundred dollars, and that was, you know, thirty years ago. I said, "Well, I never bought it, but are you kidding me?" You know. And mm-hmm. so, if you could find something like that, I but I, I, like I said, I never bought it for the money. Sure, so, never have. So, L, do you have a, a one? No. I mean, you bring up the Skinner, uh, you know, cover that they had to completely <laughs> change. You know, I, I mean, you still have that. It's yeah. part of history there. Yeah, but, but you, know, you know, but to me, having a having a record or a CD uh, or music particularly music yeah. that you're not mm-hmm. listening to. It's like having a car you don't drive. Yeah. It That's true. It, you yeah. know, it doesn't make any sense, you know. No. Music music speaks to me and I think that mm-hmm. it does to you as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's whether it's whether it's the rhythm or the or the words or or a messaging or, or whatever. Some of the some of the anti war stuff that that was done mm-hmm. in the in the sixties and and again during the uh, the W Bush administration yeah. was so powerful. Uh, I, I hear John Fogarty doing Deja Vu all over again. I just, oh, I get choked up because yeah. it reminds me of, of, 
of uh, the stuff that Neil Young and 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 uh, and other bands were doing during the Vietnam War too, you know. And 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 music. There are those who criticize music and musicians for taking a political stand. Somebody sometimes needs to speak out, and they were speaking. They, did. they yeah. were speaking for us, mm-hmm. you know. And and I. I don't. I don't want to get too deep into this, but when I was in Vietnam, I missed a lot of that stuff, you know, the the messaging because we were going through a cultural revolution, uh, music and musically as well. And and when I came home, it was it's sort of like, what my my world has changed <laughs> in so many ways. The yeah. music has changed. Everything's different, mm-hmm. you know. But anyway, that's story for another day. Well, and we'll pick that up when we're when we're wanting to do that. It, it, you mentioned. Neil Young. I know you guys mm-hmm. are both big Neil Young fans. In fact, you, uh, Don Haney <laughs> sent me a photo of the poster hanging out in your garage there. And oh. I have the same one. He gave it to me. <laughs> that was a good one. So, I, I mean, what what is it about Neil Young? I mean, uh, Al, I know you just talked about you know the, the protest, and this guy has mm-hmm. you know not been shy from you know really speaking what his truth is. Mm-hmm. Is that is that what pulls you towards a Neil Young? It it's that's part of it. Yeah. The the, the other part of it is the way he orchestrates things. Mm-hmm. Uh some of his guitar work is it, it's absolutely haunting. I mean we're talking mm-hmm. about it, I'm getting chill blains. Yeah. I, I mean it's it's I, I don't know how to describe it. There's there's a, a version of Ohio on this album and this is a kind of a, a, a rare album. You don't find this just any place. And I've had I think this is my second or third copy of it trying to find it but the 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 guitar intro on ohio mm. uh, on this one is unlike anything that you're really? going to find on any other album it's just that it's just that good and, and that exceptional mm-hmm. yeah uh he, he's he's a he's a he's a troubadour i think in the purest very much he uh he actually wrote that song in a very short period of yes. time after it the uh, kent state shootings mm-hmm. occurred and uh, they put it in, I think they had it out within a week, which was unheard really? of at the time. I still remember driving down Highway 59, my hometown, driving down to a friend's place, and I heard it for probably the second time. And my dad's car, I had it cranked up when I was doing like 70 miles an hour in a 55. I mean, I, it was so stunning. And I was just in high school at the time. Well, but, it, you know, it was just a horrible thing that happened in this country. Remember you know? that picture of that of that girl mm-hmm. crying? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And, and the words are, Ten soldiers and Nixon's coming, we're finally mm-hmm. on our own. Four dead in Ohio. Yeah. My God. I know. Think of the image, the, 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 the verbal image that goes with that picture. You know, you know what's also funny? I uh, was with some friends. Uh, David Crosby was back. I saw him for the second time here about three years ago, he played at the Fargo Theater. And he remembered coming back in 1997, there was Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Neil Young wasn't with, but he wasn't part of him at that time. But um, he talked about coming back here in 97, right during the flood, he flew over and looked at it. He, he had a pilot's plane and all that stuff, pilot's a license, but he played this song, Ohio. That was, like I said, like three, four years ago. The crowd was, I. I I can't tell you it was full to the rafters, but it was a lot of people there. And people got up, and when he sang Four Dead in Ohio and he was doing the chant, the audience stood up and was singing to it, if you want to say that. And I looked around, and some people were, you know, they were going like this. They remembered it. You know, there's a lot of people that remembered that that particular song, and it's just one of many. I had a, (laughs) and I haven't shown this to Al either, Um, back the year I graduated, I don't know if I should say what year it is because you guys were in <laughs> diapers or not around, but 1971, it was I graduated. Some friends from my hometown opened up a shop on Highway 59. If you're familiar with 59, it goes north. It was right on the edge of Thief River. And they, they had, like, I don't know, incense and all this stuff, but they also had records. And I walked in, and uh, they had these albums that you couldn't find anywhere, and these were real albums that were made during concerts, which were illegal at the time. Oh, Those, bootlegs. These were the real bootlegs. And I saw this one, and at that time I only knew Neil Young. Um, I don't even know if he, I think he had just started, it was 1971, uh, doing solo stuff, because he had been with Buffalo Springfield, if anybody knows about that yep. group. However, and this the album was there, yeah. and it was a double album, and it was Neil Young live at the Los Angeles Music Center Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. It was a very popular concert place in Los Angeles. And I bought it, and I thought, wow. And I got home, and it was on the Rubber Dubber label. I still remember the label was uh, kind of orange, 
<laughs> and I, I bought that and a James Taylor one of the same type. It was out of the same place. And I did, I had it for a long time, and it had songs on it I'd never heard before. Mm-hmm. And one of them was called uh, Sugar Mountain by, it was a song he was singing about when, you know, he was in from uh, Winnipeg. Winnipeg. And it's about getting 20 years old, and he no longer could go into the the neat place where he used to go with all his friends because you were too old to go in at 20. But at any rate, um, I had the album, and I borrowed it to a friend, and I never got it back. And Neil Young is known as recording darn near everything he ever played when he goes out. And uh, he has a huge library of songs, right. which he didn't. He, he periodically, I know, Al, you know that, He's starting to let stuff out, and I've got a stack of new albums that I, uh, some of them I had had, but these are ones that I'd never heard of. Okay, and my son bought this for me because he knew that I used to talk about that album, and <laughs> it is his album. But he, this one is a little more clear than the bootleg one. Sure. It doesn't have cost in it. Remastered So it's, it's, it's on... Uh, reprieve? Yeah, yeah, it's on Reprieve, which was the classic. I mean, that was one of the big albums yep. of Warner Brothers. Uh, I think it was actually originally for Frank Sinatra. It was an orange, kind of an orange label, and there's a... Well, at any rate. But here, he put out this album, and it's the album... It's got the songs a little closer on it, and they even made it look like it's been used. Yeah, it and this is brand look. new. Oh, and is I, it's, it you, I, this whole time I thought you you Me found too. the original. No, here. no, <laughs> no and there, I mean that's Neil Young for you. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's crazy. It, 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 the, the depth of knowledge you guys have both brought <laughs> for just of of the the albums themselves. But can you notice uh, if you listen to say a newer album versus an older? I mean the the process of the, the printing on. I mean. Can you do you notice the difference? And I ask that because mm-hmm. you got this new generation that's coming back to vinyl. Yeah. It, now you know the, the, you're seeing vinyl cells outpacing you know other means mm-hmm. of, of mm-hmm. music here. Yeah. So we're getting this new sound that you know feels warm. Yeah. Can, do you guys notice it? I mean, you you've lived on vinyl and uh, you know the turntables for such a long time, or is it as close now as it what it was back when? This was the means of what you listen. I think you'd probably be better. To uh, I think you can notice some difference, uh, and at the price, you should. But I, <laughs> yeah. I was really yeah. careful. I mean, I didn't wear white gloves, but uh, with the exception of some of the first albums I bought, including uh, most of the early Creedence Clearwater, I had a Magnavox uh, turntable, and it was the kind where you had the pull on it and you could stack them. And that one wasn't so good but most i would say 98 percent of the records i had uh, were clean i even i've still got the the cleaner that you put on and disc stuff. washer disc washer yes and uh so uh, i was always pretty careful i know i i this girl that i knew at one time in summer borrowed her um it was crosby stills and ash it was a double live album and i i loved the album and she dropped it and scratched one whole side. Oh. And that was another one that I remember, and it just drove me nuts. Uh, I don't remember the name of it by, right off the top of my head. But at any rate, you know, so I, w- I took really c- good care of them. And lots of times, even the records that you buy now, a lot of the record stores, if you're buying used, mm-hmm. which aren't cheap either, right. uh, but uh, they're pretty good. They, they don't buy, you know, wrecked ones or ones that people have, you know, yeah, scratched up and all right. that sort of stuff. So the the cartridge, I think, is really a key when it, it comes to uh, yep. you know your your turntable. turntable. And boy, I, the more money you spend, more nine out of every ten times you're going to get a much a much cleaner sound. Compare music that you guys have a love for. You talked about the you know kind of those protest songs, '60s, '70s, to what you hear mm-hmm. now. I mean, is there anything right now that kind of resembles? Any of the music? Oh. Uh, I'm just curious your thoughts because you guys know so much about music in general. Is there anything now that stands out that you would get behind? We Alan? travel. Okay. We, 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 I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. But we both, um, and I think just about all of us, everybody has, if you don't have Sirius, uh, when I travel particularly, but uh, there's so much new music, and uh, I would say a lot of it is really good. I try to write down the names so I can... Uh, you know, put them into the system in that. Because we talk about all the time. I'll say, God, Al, did you hear this? You know, and uh, a lot of stuff. And I'm sure you guys would agree, Al. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's amazing with, with SiriusXM, 
you you shouldn't even talk about that. I guess on a, no, on a radio I station. listen to KFGO very yeah. much. You well, know, when, but, when you're outside of the KFGO area, yeah, but, you, yeah. but sometimes you hear stuff you yeah. never ever thought you'd hear. I know. A dear yeah. Mr. Fantasy, a version that Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Young did. Yeah. My God, it's just incredible, and it's a and it's a great song by these guys originally. Yeah, traffic, traffic. traffic. which was which was really the first super yeah. group. Yeah. The uh, and <laughs> I think what I think something that's really interesting is how music evolves and how how these bands so many of these bands have have survived mm-hmm. now like you were talking about Neil Young now he's been re- recording since the sixties and mm-hmm. some because like he started with the Squires from Winnipeg yeah the Guess Who they're still they're live but right. Burton Cummings and Randy Bachman and they're still recording new music uh, and then you've got Dion one of the first mm-hmm. concerts I went to was the uh, Dick Clark's uh, Caravan of Stars, and it was Dion, Fabian, and, and those <laughs> I'm passing all over there. <laughs> Dion, Fabian, yeah. um, they were superstars. The Shirelles, so. I mean, they, 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 these are big stars. And here uh, now, Dion has has reinvented himself, and this this is a, a really good blues album. He borrowed and to me. It's good. He's yeah. got Joe Bonamassa playing with him, Brian Setzer, Jeff Beck, John Hammond, Van Morrison, uh, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. Paul Simon, Samantha Fish, great uh, blues guitarist, uh, Stevie Van Zandt, Patty Sialfa, and uh, Bruce Springsteen. And, and they and they recover. Jerry Lee Lewis. I showed you that album. Yeah. Here's an, here's another one that was done in England, and he's got one of our favorites playing with him. Alvin Lee of Ten Years After, mm-hmm. uh, Peter Frampton, Rory Gallagher, all kinds of different people. So these and just just think, Jerry Lee Lewis. He goes back to <laughs> the early fifties. Yeah. He was one of the original uh, uh, Johnny Cash. Yeah. Uh, Blue suede shoes. Elvis. Yeah. Elvis and that that whole bunch yeah. of sun, sons. Uh-huh. He got a little trouble too he, during he, those times. But. Oh yeah. yeah, he's the la- yes. he's the last mm. one, last man standing. Yes. You know, and, yeah. but he but they continue to play and and the, so I think back back to your question. Yeah, we listen to a lot of different stuff. The music evolves. I'm I am sad that there is still not a a venue, a real venue for uh, uh, the new music from. Uh, Tom Petty, obviously, sure. has passed. Yeah, but yeah. you know he recorded a lot of stuff uh-huh. that never got played on on uh, on classic rock radio stage because it wasn't classic; it was new. Ann Wilson and 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 Nancy Wilson, her sister, they split. They play together. Uh, they they don't. There's no no format for them there to to play new music. And uh, Jeff Lynne, mm-hmm. how about him? Jeff Jeff Lynne, that's to my to yeah, my well. way, we're thinking is one of the best. Yeah. And the Rolling Stones. Right. This 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 shirt. Came out with a uh, came with a, a new uh, Rolling Stones album that ca- that came out. Mm-hmm. See, I was uh, about five years ago. I I would guess, you know. Mm-hmm. But where's the venue for that there, there new isn't. music? Yeah, there isn't unless you know you're you're streaming it and uh, or listening to a satellite. You're paying a subscription. Mm-hmm. I've asked that uh, of. Uh, some of our other colleagues that have worked in the top 40s or the classic rocks, you know, even getting a deep cut from an old album, why we don't get more of that? You know, it's all got to be uh, on rotation of the, the, the hits. And I, you, so you're right, there's not a venue unless you seek it out or if you buy the albums yeah. and, and the records, you know. And that's one thing that I think was lost in my generation is you'll go and you'll get the hit, you'll download that, mm-hmm. burn it to a CD back in the day. Yeah, oh, yeah. Not exactly in the confines of what was legal, but the, you, you know, you didn't listen to the album in it, its way of which it was purposefully put together to tell a story at times and the flow yeah. of it. And I think that really got lost in my generation. Well, I think Jethro told it. I mean, they were, they were classics at that. So let, let me ask a question. Yeah. And, and I definitely want to ask you too. What's know. your favorite album of all time? Every, 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 <laughs> oh, what's the number boy. one album? Um, or what do you think is the greatest rock album of ever? Even greatest, if it's not yours. greatest rock album ever. God, that's a great question. You know, I. <laughs> yeah, that's I, a hard you know, choice. I know, because I, I, I think about mm-hmm. bands and not necessarily albums, because again, it's like I, I think of songs. Yeah. I didn't have, you know, so you go with Led Zeppelin. It has got to be up there for me. I'm uh, the my favorite band. So uh, being biased is the Foo Fighters. Mm-hmm. Have every single record they have got. Their so- second album of the Color and the Shape. Could listen to that nonstop over and over. <laughs> I mean, they had their hits were all on there. So, yeah. it, my mind wants it wants to go, you know, with Led Zeppelin of some sort. Heart goes with Foo Fighters. How about you? I, I would agree. Uh, boy, that's hard to say, but I would have to say 
Um, and it, it sounds, well, I know there's some people in this building that uh, pay a lot of attention. A certain boss hates them. He'll never fully admit it, but the Beatles. Oh. And uh, I've had more copies of the White Album than any other album I've had. And it started out uh, in 1968. My dad bought me a, um, there used to be a, a, a store called Gamble's. It was around a oh, lot yeah. of the areas. Mm -hmm. And they had everything. And he bought me a Coronado cassette player. And I thought, life is good. You know, it was just, you know, one of those small ones, you know. And uh, But uh, as soon as I uh, was able to get out after Christmas, I went down to the uh, music store mm -hmm. and I bought a couple of albums. And one was Peter, Paul, and Mary. And the other one was the Beatles' White Album. And it was in a box. It was like a little box. And it was two CD or two cassettes. I, maybe I was saying CDs, but cassettes. Sure. And I had those, and I thought, oh, this is unbelievable. I was listening to them, you know. Didn't come with a big speaker or anything, you know. I later was able to plug it in. But at any rate, burned up a lot of batteries first because I didn't have a cord. My dad was ready to kill me. But, uh, and then, uh, well, it was maybe a year or two later, I went and finally bought the White Album at the store. Mm -hmm. And I had that for a long time. And then, um, before I left to come to Fargo to work at the uh, station where Al worked at the time, WDAY. Uh, my boss in, in Grafton would allow me to get albums cheaply through uh, record companies. Mm -hmm. And I, I bought the entire Beatles set that was available at the time. And I never opened it. Um, they were still covered in cellophane and stuff. So I had, I don't remember, it was relatively inexpensive, all things considered. And uh, I that went with the sale. Cause, but I had, oh, I, had I had the, oh, <laughs> but... <God>. It, <laughs> You don't pick people like Mr. Yelling yeah, at you right now. Yeah, but, <laughs> but uh, and then later, I did buy it again. Uh, I've, I've got, and I've found, I've got, believe it or not, three copies of it in, in CD, two that I bought at uh, sales and the other one I bought. So I've got three, why well, I bought them, but I could, one of them is in black. It's, it was a broadcaster's thing. It was some specially designed thing. But then about two years ago for Christmas, I, I was I had a gift certificate, and uh, I went to one of the music stores here, and I bought the box set of the White Album, and the one one of the albums on it. I think there's three albums in it, mm -hmm. and it's all acoustic stuff that they were doing mm -hmm. at George uh, Harrison's house after they came back from India, and they were putting together the oh, White Album, and they were they were playing. You know, and it, it was it it, it, uh, it was worth it. It was a well, it was three figures to buy it, but it was good. And it had all the stuff that the original one had. If you've got it, um, I should have brought a frame. I, I, I kept the internal sides of those albums that were the white albums. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but all four of the red and white photos, or the, uh, the, uh, the colored photos of the Beatles, I had that stashed away, and there was a big poster that you could unfold, and it had all kinds of stuff, plus all the lyrics for the white album. But I, that... that hundred dollar one mm -hmm. was the same thing it was really cool and i i've i listened more to the uh, acoustic side it's got a name to it and i can't sure. think of it but uh, that was separate from the album itself so it's kind of cool if you're a beatles fan or if you just like it's, music yeah. it's pretty cool to listen well, to well, those people that all oh, yeah, i hate to be oh, there i act too much full of it but <laughs> funny you would mention that i was just playing that last weekend uh, that, that, <laughs> the, the, the white album <laughs> well i'm curious your answer to, to your I, own question I, I, I agree with don about a lot of the beatles stuff and yeah. i'm a sergeant peppers guy i love it but uh, in terms of rock and roll albums that's number one for me <laughs> yeah. a little rolling Rose stones don't let it oh. let it be one of mine too it's i mean it's there's so much good stuff on here. Yeah. I mean, if, if for rock and roll, and, and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young's first album mm -hmm. was, or Crosby, Stills & Nash's first album was incredible too. But in terms of just playing out and out rock and roll, there you can't you can't beat this. Mm -hmm. You just can't. And I'm a Joe Walsh fan, and I'm a oh, Joe Bonamassa fan, yes. and I like the blues, and I'm a huge Guess Who fan. Burton Cummings belongs yes. in, the guess, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, for heaven's sake. Yes, but, he should. Yeah. Fellas, I feel like we just scratch the surface, yeah. but we're out of time today. Yep. I think we do this again fun. if you guys are up for it. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's, yeah, let's exactly. do this again. Let's right. do it. Yeah. All right, Al Amit, Don Haney, my friends. It's always fun to get to know you guys as the rockers a little bit more. We'll try to get soon, <laughs> all right? <laughs>